guys let's get into the preaching of God's word if you would stand with me turn to first Corinthians chapter number one we'll be looking at verses 10 through 17 uh, this morning starting in verse number 10 Paul says as he's writing to the church at Corinth now I beseech you brethren by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. 
Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I baptized in my own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Let's go to God in a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, this, this morning I ask that uh, you do mighty work here in these services, God, as we look into uh, your word, uh, the book of Corinthians, God, as, as we look into uh, the vision uh, that was here in this Corinthian church, God, and the unity that you called for, God, the unity that you call for uh, here at Bethel and here in every one of your true local New Testament churches, God, that, that you call for a unity, you call for a oneness, Lord, for Christ is, is not divided. Uh, Lord, I ask that you hide me behind the cross this morning. Give me preaching grace I so desperately stand in need of. Lord, give me boldness, give me remembrance, most of all, God. Um, I, give you, I give you my heart, I, I give you myself this morning. And as you fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord, I just, I just pray that uh, you use me uh, as a vessel, God, to point people to, uh, point everyone, God, here to, to Jesus Christ. Uh, and that if there's somebody here lost, that they will come to know Jesus as their personal Savior. Lord, we, we thank you for the salvation we have in Jesus, and it's in his name we do pray. Amen. So, division is one of the most destructive tactics Satan uses and one of his most often used. You know, any time we see obvious and destructive division around us, okay, its root is sin and the devil is behind it pulling the strings. Division is, is one of his most popular tactics used to get people away from God. We see that all the way back to the beginning in the Garden of Eden. Where Satan wanted to separate man from God through sin. He tempts Adam and Eve. They choose to rebel against God. Therefore being separated from God through sin. And that death and that sin passed upon all men. We see Satan working in the garden to separate Adam and Eve from that garden. Then not too long down the road, we see Cain and Abel. What happens there? Brother against brother. We see division. We see quarrel. We see fighting. And we see a murder between Cain and Abel. Then we see Israel turning against uh, their leader Moses or turning against each other as they've divided. We see on down in the Old Testament, Israel, a nation divided into two. We see, we get into the New Testament, we see religious groups that are completely different and, 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 and that are teaching contrary messages. We see the greatest missionary ever, Paul, and Barnabas, the son of encouragement. Together, what a great team they made, but we see a division among them. We see a division here in the Corinthian church that Paul is writing about. Guys, Satan has used this tactic for <laughs> since the very beginning, and he continues to use it today. He continues to use it to separate families, to separate nations, to separate churches. Division is a tactic of Satan. Now, we see divisions and quarrels. We see them all around us. Quarrels are just a part of life. Infants, if they don't get what they want, well, they cry, right? Young children, if something gets taken away from them that they don't want, well, they cry. You know, all our life we start fighting over rattles. Then we fight over toys. Then we fight over a football. Then we fight over a position on the team. Then we fight in business or politics. Seems like all throughout our life, every stage, there's a quarrel, there's a fighting, there's a division. We see division all around us. 
We see division among family and friends. Maybe you're in that position. With your family, there's division there. Maybe with among your friends, there's division. A tactic Satan's used sometimes is division in marriage. We see that division all around us. We see division not only in family, friends, marriages, in businesses. We see division in cities, states, and even nations. We see division even to the point of war. Guys, speaking of nations, I won't get into it too much, but we see great divisiveness in our nation right now. It is destructive and unproductive to a nation when there are divisions. But on top of all this, to be more specific with our text, we also see division among churches. Sadly. Each one of us, I'm sure, has been a part of or witnessed some sort of church division. Whether that be a church split, church quarrel, church fight, church problems, right? If we've been in church long enough, we've seen that or we've been a part of that. We know that it's, that it's not a, 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 sadly, it's not as rare as it should be. Satan has used this tactic of division to tear apart local churches since they began. Again, we see it here in Corinth. When two or more people, and here's the, here's the math, simple, simple way. When two or more people, right, are bent on having their own ways, when they have different opinions and different thoughts, and they give no room to either way, the math, two plus two equals four, there will be divisions, there will be quarrels if we stick to our own wants. You know, the Bible tells us that we are all sinners, for all sin to come short of the glory of God. And the root of that sin is the I. How do you spell sin? S-I-N. So what's the, what's the heart of sin? I. It always will be. It's ego. It's I've got to look out for number one. It's self-will is always at the forefront of sin, and that is also always at the forefront of division. James chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 says this, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members? You lust and you have not. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. They come from our lust. They come from our flesh. Unity, guys, and you know this. If, if you've been married long enough, you know this. If you've been in any kind of situation with anybody, you know this. Unity is not accomplished by always insisting on our own way 100% of the time. We will not have unity. But putting the interests of the Lord and His people above our own interests is where we find unity. Is where we find togetherness. Division, fightings, and quarrels, they are forbidden by God. They're out of character with the Christian's new nature. And honestly, they're in opposition to everything the Lord wants in His church. We'll see it here in a minute in verse 13 that there's a oneness in Christ, that Christ is not divided. So a divided church or a division is not, not, not of Christ at all, for Christ is not divided. The Lord laments and opposes division while Satan applauds it. And wants to foster it as much as possible. Backbitings, bickerings, fightings, it weakens a church and hurts its testimony before the, before the world. Divisions in a church are displeasing to God. And the first need, before we get into verse 10, the first need of the Corinthian church, the first need of every local church, the first need of every relationship is unity. The early church in Jerusalem. Are we familiar with that? The book of Acts. Let's, I want to share two verses. Acts chapter 2, verse 46 through 47. I want to share a little bit about the early church in Jerusalem. It says this. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, Praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily as such 
should be saved. The early church in Jerusalem, we see a unity, we see a oneness, and what else do we see? We see their ministry bearing great fruit. We see that church, that, that church exploding. We see people coming to know the Lord therein one accord. Verse number 10. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Paul exhorts him. He says, I beseech you, I exhort you. There's a plea here. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ. He's serious that they agree and that there not be any divisions. I want to look first at the plea. He exhorts and they, he wants agreement on godly matters. Paul says there's need to be united in the same mind and the same judgment. He says, guys, y'all need to be in agreement on the things pertaining to God. Just three little subpoints we're going to look at. One, they need to be agreement on unity in general. There just needs to be unity in their church. Secondly, there needs to be unity on doctrine. They need to agree with with the doctrine that they that they believe. They can't everybody can't believe everything that they want to believe. It's no it's we believe in this doctrine, this certain doctrine, grace, salvation by grace through faith, right? The virgin birth of Jesus, right? Eternal security in Christ. There must be agreement here with these doctrines. And then thirdly we'll look at that that there also must be agreement in the direction that God is leading his church. Right? If, if the Lord's leading Bethel in one way or leading another church in, in, in one way, if we're members of that church, wherever God is leading, we must follow where God is leading His local church. Now, united, or, or in our verse it says uh, that you be perfectly joined together. That word united, uh, it, may, it, it carries the term, this, this word was used if somebody was mending a net together. Okay, Somebody's mending a net. They would use that word. Or uh, a dislocated joint or a broken bone, anything like that. That's what that word was using. It's put back together. The word division here physically means to rip or to tear apart in the Greek. Okay, I mean, it's just completely tear apart. And metaphorically, it just means different of, of opinions, different judgment, a different mindset altogether. Unity, and, then, and this is under the, this is the unity in general. Guys, unity must be genuine. Now, if you're reading this verse, it says that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Okay? Guys, unity must be genuine. It's a lot more than speaking and saying that you agree with something. Because we can speak and say, absolutely, I agree with that. But in our heart, in our judgment, in our mind, we don't. Right? We don't agree at all. We, we're, we're torn. We're, we're divided. In our speech, we, we say we're for it, but in our heart, we're not. Right? So it says not only in the same speech, same testimony, but in the same mind and same judgment that we must be as a local church united. There must be unity in our thoughts and our hearts on godly matters. Now, if you would allow me, uh, I, I do like to give illustrations um, I just feel like um, it's better to help us remember things okay uh, better to help us uh, picture it so when we leave here we can remember so I'm going to give it to Nicole this this video while I'm giving this you'll see in a minute uh, I'm going to have an illustration down here on the floor so just so other people can just so other people that are not in the inside can see it my beautiful wife my my uh, my Test dummy today. I've never, uh, not dummy, not dummy, just test, not dummy, just, a, just my, just my, my person to test it on today. Man, I, I'm going to get myself in a lot of trouble. I'm already am. Yeah. Okay. So, so first, look at this. Um, okay, three. I've got three plastic cups, and let's just say these are people, right? And these people have 
branched off from the, from the main group and they formed their, they formed their own group, right, together, right? This division, this Paul, Apollos, Cephas, Christ, yeah, right? Whatever, like our scripture says. Now, when adversity comes, let's see what happens, uh, Alyssa. Let's so stand on these, adversity's coming, and let's see if these cups are able to hold adversity. How about that one? It doesn't work, does it? No, they, they, they fall apart. It just, it just cannot work when we're, t- when we're separated. But yet, if we come together, the three, they come together as one. Three more, they come together. The whole church comes together in agreement. They come together in unity. They come together in agreement. They're in the same mind. They're in the same judgment. There's no divisiveness. They're glued together as one. Then when adversity, then when judgment comes, they will be able to stand, Lord willing. Now, beautiful wife, When adversity comes, when they're together, they are able to stand. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you so much, Alyssa. Now, what I wanted to get out of that illustration was for us to picture that, that when we do come together, when we do come together as one, even if the weight of the world, the weight of temptation, the weight of whatever, the weight of... (laughs) The, the weight of our enemy coming down, bearing down on us, that we will be able to stand. Nicole, and get my, get my iPad back so we can go back to, uh, to that. So hopefully we can have that imprinted in our mind to see kind of what unity is. Now, as we continue here, a plea on godly matters. They must be in unity on their doctrine and their beliefs. Guys, People do not have to be carbon copies of each other. I want to make that point real quick. We're all made different, are we not? Completely different. Guys, we're going to disagree on what the best truck brand is. Okay? I'll say I love Ford. Chevy. Some people say Chevy. Some people say GMC, right? Or General Motors. Some people say a Dodge, right? Everybody has their own uh, opinion. Or the football team. Uh, don't say anything about the Kansas City Chiefs over, over in this direction. Right? Or the Dallas Cowboys or baseball team, the Cardinals or the Cubs. Right? There's, just a, there's always a, a division or the favorite type of pie, whether it be coconut, whether it be chocolate. That's all good and well. Like what you want. Be divided on your football teams, on your pies. We like different things. That's all fine. But when it comes to godly things, when it comes to key doctrinal matters, when it, comes to, uh, when it comes to a Christian lifestyle, we must be in agreement, we must be in unity on that. No matter how impossible it may seem, we've got to agree on these things. Because new Christians are unbelievers. They become confused when the church is not uh, an agreement on doctrine. They'll hear conflicting thoughts. They'll come and say, well, we've, uh, I believe this, and somebody else over here, I believe this, I believe this. And they're thinking, what's the truth? <laughs> which one's right? And what they do is they find which one's more pleasing to them, and they'll join that group. But we must be agreement on our doctrine. Absolutely about the gospel, the Bible, or Christian living. So for a church to be spiritual healthy, there must first and foremost be doctrinal unity. Now, we have doctrinal unity here at Bethel, Right? We adhere to a set of beliefs uh, that we say we believe that have been uh, put together by the ABA, right? The American Baptist Association. We have doctrine that we say we believe these things. And we've adopted that doctrine and say we believe these things. And everybody that's become a member of Bethel says, yes, we believe these doctrines. And these doctrines can be uh, assessed anywhere. They're on our website. They're on our Facebook page. They're on the ABA website. Wherever you want to see, these are the doctrines that we agree on. And there must be that unity, that agreement in doctrine if we're going to be successful spiritually. There are new brands of churches, okay, that are incredible at unity on a social level and unity on an organizational level. I mean incredible, right? 
you go and it's socially, organizationally, they're top knots, they've got everything in order. It's a, it's a wonderful time and they grow socially and they grow organizationally. But yet they're divided on their doctrine. They're divided on their beliefs. It's a church full of, uh, a church full of people that believe different things about key doctrinal matters. So yet they grow socially, they grow organizationally, they're not growing spiritually. They're not growing doctrinally. And that's our, that's our whole purpose, is it not? To grow spiritually, to grow in the Lord. So, but I don't think that you have to separate them. I think that you can grow spiritually, be in doctrinal unity, and have social unity, and have organizational unity all in one. Amen. Doctrinally, ethically, and spiritually, they're very different. They're very confused. You ask one, they say this. Ask another, they will say this. You know, many people do not want absolutes in their life, right? A no or a yes. They don't want absolutes in doctrine or ethics because absolutes demand absolute acceptance and absolute obedience. People want, we pick and choose what we want and how we want to believe. Many churches have catered to this want, but the Bible lays out absolutes, absolute beliefs, absolute doctrines that we adhere to here at Bethel. Bethel Missionary Baptist Church holds to an absolute standard and absolute beliefs. Uh, there are many things in Scripture that God has made very abundantly clear, okay? That are, that, in my opinion, I don't think it's necessarily opinion, or not arguable. We hold true to. And these things should not be disagree, disagreed upon uh, or, or have differing opinions about. You know, God is not self-contradicting, right? His word is not self-contradicting. He is true, it's error-free, it's perfect, okay? So just some examples. One, I mentioned this. Uh, Crystal sang a song about it. Salvation by grace through faith, right? Absolutely, there, there's no argument there, okay? Ordinances. Let's talk about those for a minute. I believe, we believe, there are two ordinances in the local church. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. These are the only two ordinances. But we also believe that they're not a means for grace. They're not a means for salvation. Meaning salvation is apart from these ordinances. We find salvation by grace through faith, the blood of Jesus Christ. We do not find it in, in the ordinances. Okay? They are merely a picture. A picture of the Lord's Supper, a picture of, of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. His sacrifice. Baptism, it's a picture of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As you're submerged, you're completely immersed and you rise with newness of life. We believe in the eternal security of the believer. And believe scripture teaches this as well. And I believe that we should be in unity on these doctrinal matters. Now... A church must agree, and this is the third sub-point, a church must agree on where God is leading. There must be agreement on decisions made within the local church. We must go with decisions of the congregation. Congregation votes on something, uh, whatever that may be. You know, 90% of church says, let's go in that direction. 10% says, does it? Well, the 10%, we must say, even though that's not what I voted for, the church is going in that direction. Therefore, I myself will be in unity with the local church. And I, I believe that's the only way we must, again, get rid of our self-wills, our, our ego, that heart of sin, that I, and we must uh, be there in unity. I'll say this as well, and this is always hard to, to talk on these matters, but leaderships of pastors and church leadership uh, should be followed and not constantly pushed against uh, in a local church. Godly men are, are Christ instruments for leading and shepherding His people. Uh, if the if the leaders if the direction maybe the church leadership suggests is biblical, not against scripture, is in line with God's word, it's sought out through prayer. They should be followed by members of the church for the sake of harmony and unity. But guys, I want to say this: the key to doctrinal unity, the key to unity, the key to uh, decisions made is having godly leadership and having godly members that are adhered to the will of the Spirit. Okay, that, that's the main thing, is if the leadership is godly and the members are godly, they're seeking this will of the Spirit, right? Then we can make 
good decisions. Leaders and members who are not close to the Lord or well taught in His Word uh, cannot lead a church effectively or make sound decisions. Lastly, uh, before we get to verse 11, God has a main purpose for every local church. The Great Commission, right? To share Jesus Christ, to win people to the Lord, to baptize them, to teach them, to observe all things. God also has a very specific direction. He leads each and every church in different directions. Not away from Scripture, not away from the Great Commission, but different directions to achieve that main purpose. A church must agree, be in unity about that direction. They must put away their own selfish wills or desires, be in unity with the direction of the congregation where God is leading. Again, it's not just done in speech, but it's done in the same... Same what? Mind and judgment. The same mind and the same judgment. Now, verse 11 says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are the household of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Now, uh, we've got these groups, these parties, right? Loyalty to men. Uh, he learned through it through the household of Chloe. Uh, this was probably a, 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 somebody that was in the Corinthian church, maybe a prominent person. They had written to Paul. They had come to Paul. They say, Paul, there's divisions in Corinth. There's people saying, I'm of Paul. I'm of Apollos. Cephas is Peter. I'm of Peter. I'm of Christ. Okay, there's these, there's these four groups, these loyalty to men. Now, the first two tell you a little bit about them. Paul, right? He was an apostle. He was also the founder of the Corinthian church. He had founded that church. He's the one that started it, that, 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 had the, that laid the groundwork through the Lord and, and, and that discipled those people. Then you had Apollos. He was the, one of the first pastors there at the Corinthian church. He was a pulpiteer. He could preach, boy. He was, he was dominant. He was pre boy, they loved Apollos. He was an early pastor. The first two groups of Paul and of Apollos, they had their favorite former pastor. They, they followed the men that had been there before. They were great teachers of the early years. People clung to the man. Uh, pa Paul might have led them to the Lord, and, and they clung to Paul because of, uh, he had evangelized them. He had taught them in the Word for years. They, they, they clung to, um, to Apollos because of, of his early ministry there in the church. And it's very natural to have affection for the person who led you to the Lord, who has fed you the Word of God for many years, for a Sunday school teacher, for a deacon who has consoled you during your hard times. It's natural and it's great to have that affection. But such affection, it becomes misguided. It becomes carnal when it is allowed to segregate us from the church, from the others, and decrease our loyalty in other leaders. So we see that they had decreased their loyalty to other leaders. They had separated themselves from others in the church to follow Paul or Apollos. They say, that, that's who I'm under. But no, uh, again, is Christ divided. The third group of Cephas, Peter. Peter was one of the twelve apostles. He was a leader. He was a very practical, great speaker, very practical teacher. Okay? I mean, that's one of the original 12 that walked with Jesus. And they say, I'm a Peter, man. That's a, he stood up at, at Pentecost. And 3,000 came to know the Lord through his sermon. That's the man. It's Peter. They were following Peter. And the fourth group claimed to follow Christ. I'll let you know, being that Christ was named among these three, they had the right name. But they had the wrong spirit. Okay? They had the wrong spirit. And this group represents people in rebellion against all and any spiritual leaders. They say, uh, you know, there's no need for human instructors, <laughs> despite the Lord's provision for godly leadership. He, they, they, people say, these people said, I'm of Christ. I don't need leaders. I don't need men. Uh, no, I, I don't need that. This may be the most pious and self-righteous of all the groups. 
that was mentioned here in 1 Corinthians. Pretense, they had a pretense of following Christ, but yet they followed only themselves. Guys, I do want to say this, and you might have seen this. Division usually manifests itself under the guise of spirituality. Right? Said, I'm being spiritual, I'm standing in the right, and it guises itself as spiritual, but yet it's carnal. You know, how many, well, don't raise your hand. But all the time, whatever side we're on, we say God is on our side in the argument, right? God's on the, whatever side in a church that they agree on, they say, well, God's on our side. We're obviously in the right on these matters. Even those that are generally on the right side of the argument are usually wrong or can be wrong in spirit. Unforgiveness. A lack of love. Hate, pride, anger, self-will. They might be on the right side of the issue, but their spirit about the matter is completely wrong. This is this I am of Christ group. Spirituality produces humility and unity. I'll say that again. Spirituality produces humility and unity. Carnality produces pride and division. Paul calls on the church to be spiritual. To rid themselves of the parties they align themselves to and to unite as one. Look at verse 13. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He was making the point and this principle of oneness in Christ. Paul was making the points that Christians are one in Christ and should do nothing to represent otherwise or to destroy that unity. The church, the local church, is the body of Christ. And Christ is not divided. Therefore, the church should not be divided. A Christian church that is divided is a contradiction. It's a contradiction. 1 Corinthians, here and later, and we'll look at this uh, on down the road a little bit, but 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 12 through 13, just listen to these words. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit all were baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. We see unity here. There's many other verses that declare this truth. A divided church is in the opposition to the Lord and to the Lord's will. Paul asks, he says, was Paul crucified for you? So I'll ask you that. Was Paul crucified for the Corinthians? Was Paul crucified for Bethel? Who was? Jesus Christ. Paul says, was I baptized for you? They said, the answer is no. Jesus Christ was, ba or, <laughs> Jesus Christ was baptized for you. He says, were you baptized in my name? Well, no, they were baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? They were not baptized in the name of Paul. Paul did not want any part of their fa factions. They say, we're, we're of you, Paul. We're on your side. He says, Get a, I don't want any part of that. The, guys, Christ was crucified for you. You're baptized in the name of Jesus, guys. My purpose is not to bring people, uh, is my purpose is to bring people to Christ, Paul says. It's not to bring people to myself. And I fear many leaders have that backwards. It's say, look at me instead of look at Christ. My job, Jeremy's job, uh, church leaders' job is to point people to Jesus Christ, not to ourselves. It's to show the path to salvation. It's to lead people to the cross and deny ourselves. We see, lastly, the priority. He says, I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius. Lest any should say that I had baptized in my own name. He says, and I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me to not to baptize but to preach the gospel. 
Not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. The priority was the gospel. Preaching the gospel. The gospel had a priority over baptism. Many were very confused, right, about baptism and the gospel. And the gospel will always have priority over baptism. Many people are confused about baptism maybe being part of the gospel and therefore necessary for salvation. Again, I say this passage refutes that teaching. Christ says, I came not to baptize. I came to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. Paul clearly states that baptism, it's distinct, and it's separate from the gospel, and it is separate from salvation. Baptism has no part in salvation. Never has and never will. Paul recalls some of the people that he had baptized. He says, well, uh, Gaius and Crispus, and he says... Oh, well, hold on, I forgot one, the household of Stephanus, but I don't remember if I baptized any other. But he says, I'm thankful that I did not baptize many people because think about the more people Paul baptized, there would be more people that would be tempted to be prideful and say, I'm on Paul's side. Paul baptized me, the great, uh, the person who crucified Christians for years and years and years, but yet he turned to the Lord, the greatest missionary, the founder of this church, the founder of, of many churches. Well, Jesus Christ is the rock. He used Paul. They, they would have pride in Paul. He says, thank goodness I didn't baptize many. He did not want the glory. He wanted God to get all the glory Paul's primary calling was elsewhere besides baptism. It was preaching the gospel. Above all division, party loyalty and quarreling that was going on, Paul lets them know the number one priority, preaching the gospel. As we each and as collectively as Bethel Baptist Church, have the right priority in our lives. We too will be, will be determined to serve the Lord in truth and in unity, not living in the carnality and confusion of dissension and division. If we will realize that priority in our life, we won't have time to put our focus on other things. When our focus is on Jesus Christ, Him crucified, the gospel, winning people to the Lord, if all our energy and all our desires are, and all our thoughts and all our minds are put towards that, the priority, these other things that the devil lingers, that the devil tries to distract. We're going back to the beginning, the attack that the devil uses to get our mind off the priority, to get us quarreling, to get us stopping sharing the gospel. That's his goal, to stop us being a lighthouse. But if we will give our whole heart to the gospel to Jesus Christ, the main priority, and not worry about this tactic uh, of Satan. No, it's there, but focus on the priority. We will be in unity, working together. I've given this, this illustration before. Chris Tucker shared it with me. I, I'll use it a lot. I, I love it. It says, um, when you, uh, you've got hound dogs, or, or well, he hunts coons, so you've got coon dogs together in a cage, right? He puts three in there, right? And you, they're in there, and they're just... Right in the back of the truck, and they're just bickering, they're biting each other, hate each other, and that they're just combined up in this little cage. But when you let them go and they get on the trail to hunt coons, they're in unity. Boy, they go together, they go in the same group, right? They're barking together, they're in unity because they're doing what they're supposed to do, they're doing their purpose, they're doing what they were built to do. Us as local church were built to share the gospel, us as Christians were built to share the gospel. When we're on that path and we're hunting, guess what? We're in unity. When we're just cooped up, not doing what we're supposed to do, there might be some bickering. I want to close with Psalm 133. One. It says, I opened the services in prayer about 945 this morning with this verse. It says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to to dwell together in unity. We as a church, as Bethel, 
We must always be in complete unity. It's beautiful, a church that is in complete unity. As we quietly stand, as Brother Jeremy, our musicians, come forward this morning. One, I ask, are you divided? Is there a divisiveness in your life? Do you need to get right with a brother or a sister in Christ? Is there divisions, friends, family, marriage? I don't know what it is in your life. Is there something that you need to speak with the Lord about this morning? Is there something that you need to respond that God has laid on your heart? But the greatest priority is knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you are divided from God, if you are separated from God through the awful gulf of sin, if you have never come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior, this invitation is for you. Guys, we're all sinners for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God in Romans 3, 23. The wages of that sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. It is only through Jesus Christ that you will be saved. It is only through Jesus Christ and His righteousness that you will spend eternity in heaven. We're separated from God, we're divided from God, from sin in our lives. And Jesus Christ is the bridge for salvation. If you have not accepted Jesus today, be I, I, I pray you be reconciled. You be adopted into the family of God today. You be redeemed, covered by the blood of Jesus, forgiven for your sins. Whatever your need is, please come.